Hello and a very warm welcome ladies and gents, boys and girls. My name is Aram, this is the Competitive Rowing Channel. Today's topic, a very important one, is I think how to plan like a professional athlete and coach for a full macro cycle of rowing training. If you haven't heard the term macro cycle, it's very simple. We usually distinguish in scientific training planning between macro cycle, meso cycle and micro cycle. Macro is usually year, Meso is usually a month to six weeks and micro is usually a week to maybe 10 days. Again, there are deviations. For many people, peak of season is just about to be over or has already happened. And this is usually when the new season starts because a full season consists of 52 weeks. Most people don't realize that. With this video, I'm not gonna be able to cover it all, but I'm trying to cover all the things that I personally think are very important and I know I'm gonna leave out stuff. Let's get started. First of all, we have to distinguish between the general things, between knowing yourself, strength and endurance. General things. Whenever we talk about training planning, these are one of the most commonly overlooked things that I experience when I start to work with new athletes on the team. By the way, if you wanna join the team, it's rmtraining.com. First of all, you have to make sure you know what you want. Do you want a quick fix? or you want a consistent, constant development over years. Most people want to be fit and healthy over years. Most people don't want to have a quick fix for six months and then happens whatever happens. I'm in for the long game. That doesn't mean I can't help you if you only have six months of time. I've done this before, even before we had championships, and it works. But whenever you coach something like that, you have to keep in mind as a, tra as, as a coach, as a trainer, that you will be responsible for what's going to happen in 12 and 18 and 24 months as well although you're not writing the plan you're laying the path which means i cannot do a quick peek and devastate and select and whoever survives survives i have to plan long term even if i'm in for the short game by that i mean we can peak within three months if that's all the time you've got but ideally even that small short-term planning, it shouldn't burn you so hard that you cannot continue to train afterwards. Now, ideally, you have a longer time horizon, a year, one and a half years, five years. That's different from person to person. Next point, the goal setting. You have to be clear on where you are and where you wanna be, and realistically clear. There's no use saying, hey, I'm doing eight minutes 50 in a single on the water over 2K right now and I wanna drop it to seven minutes within six months. Isn't gonna happen. Same on a 1K. I did a five minute 12 on a 1K, I wanna drop it to 422 within six months. Unless you add an engine to the boat, it's not gonna happen. There are some, there are instances where we can knock off 10 seconds, 20 seconds, sometimes even 25 seconds. But that is usually not only the result of improvement of your rowing technique, improvement of your cardiovascular capacity because that takes most of the time, improvement of your strength, improvement of, of your mobility. It is usually a combination of all of these factors. Now, whenever I do coaching, all these parameters are added. You cannot leave one thing out. However, you've got to be realistic. I don't mean to be skeptic. I don't mean to be negative. I don't mean to be hopeless. I have high ambitions, but be prepared. It's going to take a lot of work and be prepared. It's going to take consistency in the first case. Next thing, time budget. There's no use to say, I will do five sessions a week. No, I will do six sessions a week. Um, let me see, I have five kids. I wanna spend time with my kids. Um, I've got a 70 hour a week job. Yeah, I can do easily. I can easily do six sessions. I just sleep four hours a night. I, that's okay. See, that's utopias. I heard scientists say, um, the percentage of people who can get by on less than seven hours of sleep is close to nil, nothing, zero. So you need sleep. Without sleep, no repair. Without repair, no super compensation. Without super compensation, no training effect. So lots of training effect happens when you sleep. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. I've got three kids, I've got two companies, I'm busy but sleep is a priority. It is better if you feel like now that you're motivated, say, I want to do six units a week, go with five. If you say, I'm definitely gonna do five, go with four. 
So I would always take one step. You can always increase later on, but for now, reduce one step, okay? Same with, with time. I can commit three hours a day. Start with two. I can easily commit two hours per day. Excellent, let's start with 90 minutes. One and a half hours, no problem. Excellent. If you say 90 minutes from the start, I recommend an hour. So the point is that you have to get into a habit. Motivation is something that is a belief quickly. What counts then is how you see yourself. How do you, how do you perceive yourself? What do you perceive yourself to be? Uh, if you perceive yourself to be an athlete, you're still, you're still going to do the workout, although you're not motivated. Motivation is something that comes and goes. With the motivation, you use, you use motivation as a fire to start a habit. But habit is the fire that keeps you warm, not motivation. Motivation burns you and keeps you hot for a short time. The long game, and training is about the long game, is about habits and consistency. Environment, very simple. If you want to be a fast rower, but there is nothing that you have available that could be closely called something, uh, a rowing machine, even one of these linear pull ergs, you've got an issue. You can get by two to three months without these. That's okay. I've done this myself, but not longer. You will probably need some type of strength device. If there's nothing that you have available, we can get by with body work alone, that's okay, but ultimately it would be ideal if you have some kind of gym equipment. And a rubber band, or we call them Terra band in German, would be helpful if you have one. Good. Training volume. That goes hand in hand with the time budget. Your training volume, less is more. If you think you can do 20 kilometers per day, start with 10. Trust me. There is no use burning yourself with a peak of motivation now when you actually want to create a habit. Overdoing it is the death for any habit. And last but not least, and probably one of the most important things, and that's what I feel is missing with 99% of all training plans that I've read so far and seen. Almost nobody anticipates recovery periods or anticipates them when it's already too late or waits for clear alarm signals from the body. You have to anticipate them before you become overly tired. Some people may argue, well, then if you don't become overly tired, there's no growth. True, to a certain degree, but also not true to a certain degree. That's where experience of your coach comes in. Most people overdo it, especially if you do the training by yourself. All right, next point, know yourself. Um, be honest, do an honest assessment of your mobility. Um, I charted down mobility versus flexibility. A lot of people think they're mobile when all they can do is stretch. But stretching is passive, we need active mobility. Active mobility is a full range of motion exercise. For example, can you do an overhead deep squat? Can you do a squat in front of a wall at all? Um, what is your ankle mobility? Um, what is your pelvic mobility? Can you do a Romanian deadlift? Doesn't mean you need to use a lot of weight. Can you do a good morning? You can use a broomstick. Um, I if you're interested, I will do a video of the most important mobility exercises you need for rowing. Because I think this is one of the most overlooked factors of them all. Um, people row in their backs, especially on linear ergs, um, when they lack, simply lack pelvic full range of motion strength. Not flexibility, full range of motion strength. The muscle needs to work with the entire range of motion. Technique. Is your own technique good or not? I mean, I can help you look at that and assess that. If you have old bad habits, we might have to get rid of these first before we start to train with high volume and high load. Because some people have got accustomed to a technique that is almost destructive for their bodies. Now let's talk about the actual training plan components. Strength and endurance are the two most important components when it comes to rowing. Rowing is a strength and endurance workout that is low impact. That most people don't understand that. The original rowing motion, and again, I'm hammering the linear erg. The linear erg is not low impact, it is high impact. The original rowing motion is low impact. It's easy on your joints, but it's strength and cardio workout. It's essentially everything doctors say you should do until you're dead old and want to be fit. They just, what is, what is you rowers know that. The oldest competitive age category in rowing is at 87 years age, every 87 years average age. I mean, that's fantastic. At, at the Euromasters Munich, the oldest competitor was 96, 97 years old. He had three races. Hey, at that age, people debate with themselves if they can go to the restroom alone or not. These guys, they're racing. <laughs> that is, for me, that is a role model. 
because everybody can be fit when you're young. The question is, are you fit when you're old? And everybody wants to be fit like a rower. Many people ask me, is it fun to work with masters rowers? And my honest opinion is yes. Sometimes it's even more rewarding than working with Olympic athletes. Very simple reason. When I was 20, 21, 22 in the national team, I thought it's all about qualifying for world championships and, and hopefully making to making to the Olympics. But once I was in there, I saw how unprofessional things are, where still are, still are in many cases. And that's why I left the system before my career actually started. This is, for me, it was, it turned me off, to be honest. And then I was completely struck and said, why, I mean, I'm never gonna be a master's rower, either, either world championships or nothing. World championship, that system, with, with the national team, were selected on such a short notice and, and no real buildup over, over more, more than one year, more than one season, just a couple of weeks before the Worlds. I'll leave this. And this is when I lost my identity. So all the, all the energy I had put into training before, I put into work. 80, 90, 100 hours, I did this for 15 years. Until my doctor said, look buddy, either you change something or you're gonna die, it's that simple. And I gained weight because I deprived myself of sleep. So I tried to compensate lack of sleep with food, which doesn't work. I mean, everybody, if you're, I'm coach, I know that. But at the same time, if you're in that game, it's quite, quite difficult to get out. And then I, then I got kids and then I, I actually changed something and I reduced to 80, 70 hours a week. This is where I'm right now. The thing is that we are in for the long game. A rower is in for the long game. I mean, rowing is such a healthy sport. It's probably one of the healthiest sports you can do. And everybody wants to be fit like a rower. No, not like a young rower, because everybody gets older. You, you young guys forget that. Once you're 20, time doesn't run, it races. It is crazy. You turn 20, 21, 22 is okay, boom, you're 30. Holy moly, I'm 30. 31, 32, 30, 40. 40? 50, 60. And all of a sudden you realize, you know, some youngsters are smart asses when they're young and then they realize I'm getting older too. And everybody wants to be fit like an old rower because these old guys are fit as hell. See? And this is, when I'm talking about training planning, this is what matters. Go for the Wills, go for the Olympics, but have the long game in mind. That's what matters the most. And right now I'm fighting my way back into becoming a good Masters athlete for myself. I'm not there to beat any records, I don't have the time for that. But at least four good training sessions a week. That's what matters for me, okay? Now everybody has different goals, but when we talk about training planning, I'm in for the long game because it matters more. Now, strength is next to endurance, the key ingredient. We got technique, strength, and endurance. But if we just talk about training planning, strength and endurance are the two key ingredients. Strength, we have to differentiate between specific and non-specific strength. A non-specific strength exercise is something you can do in the gym. It could be a deadlift, it could be an overhead deep squat. Anything that would help you to gain non-specific strength. Then you use, all the way in the bottom, asymmetric core strength to connect the peripheric muscle groups. That's what nobody realizes. First you strengthen the peripheric muscle groups, then you connect them with asymmetric core strength. Why do we do non-specific strength? Do we actually want to do hypertrophy? Huh. Yes, but strength training for rowing works differently than for most other sports. The thing is that an the average masters rower is probably fitter than the average sports student. And all of these, or most of these scientific studies have been conducted with sports students. So most of the data is simply not relevant to rowers. It's that simple. So I had to find my own truth and how things work. The way it is, from my point of view, that we use hypertrophy about the first, first third of the year. Why do we want to build more muscles? Not for the sake of having more muscle mass, that may be one. But the greater benefit is to have higher bone density to, in, to cope with the endurance loads, strength endurance loads. It's not just endurance, this is not cycling. This is strength endurance. Everybody who remembers their first rowing outing remembers, holy moly, this is, you can't get out of that system. It is, um, in, in German there's a saying, you can't get out of that number. It essentially means there's no easy way out. It is strength and endurance. It's not like you can save on strength and do the endurance part or 
save on endurance, you can do the strength part. You need both. And therefore, all the endurance work we do is the stress on your bones. A healthy stress to a certain degree, but I want to make sure that my athletes are fit. I don't care Olympic, World Championship, Junior, Under-23, Masters. You have to be fit. You can be a complete beginner, and I coach you to successful Masters level. But you have to be healthy. This is why I do hypertrophy um, when we're pretty far away from peak of season. Mostly because hypertrophy and anaerobic development doesn't really go hand in hand too well. This is why I try to keep peak of season, main peak of season, and hypertrophy training apart. Then, as we reach um, more mid season and, and peak of season, we will do endurance strength training. So simply higher repetition count. And not all the exercises that we did before. There are only so many overhead deep squats you can do on a healthy basis um, in, b before your shoulders start to hurt. Move on, endurance. Endurance essentially evolves around aerobic and anaerobic endurance. And that, that is nothing new. The thing is that in rowing you need both. And most people have a deficit on one or the other end. Um, my experience is that most people actually are okay when it comes to the low low stuff. So they rumble around with a stroke rate at 20, but that's not low low, that's low low is 16, 15, 14, 18. Um, because this is when you need to work on your technique. 20 is no man's land, unless you go 20 with decent force. And most people are pretty good um, <clears throat> at mid intensity sprints. Where most people are not good is that middle part of endurance you need for the race, for the first half of the race, and um, sprint capacity, which is the last part of the race. <laughs> the most important aspects are missing for most people because it's uncomfortable to train and people don't like to schedule that for themselves or they don't know how to do it. And that brings me to the next point, slow lactate increase versus lactate tolerance. It's also called lactate mobilization factor. So the lactate mobilization means how quickly can you build lactate? You have to know that scientifically speaking, um, you're always building lactate, even now we call it the rest lactate. Lactate is a byproduct of the muscle contraction, which is a biochemical process, where we split from one an adenosine triphosphate, one is gonna split off, it's gonna be an adenosine diphosphate, so ADP, and within that process, um, lactate is one of the byproducts, which is recycled, reused, for the ATP resynthesis, I think that's what it's called in English. So we'll return ADP back into ATP, which the muscle can use again. If you don't know what ATP is, it's the only source of energy the muscle can directly use. And everything you put into your system is eventually gonna be turned into ATP. If we didn't have ATP, we'd be dead in 10 seconds. Now, the point is that in Rome, you want to achieve two things, and that's what most people don't understand as well. On the one hand side, we wanna make sure that we can pull as many watts as possible without going into anaerobic, in the anaerobic state. Anaerobic state means where the body, <laughs> produce, per mole of glucose you have, when you're in aerobic state, the body produces roughly 34 usable moles of um, ATP. The moment we switch, or we, it's it's a great, it's it's not a, a binary thing. It's it's more a crossover zone. But when you're truly anaerobic, um, one mole of glucose yields two mole of ATP. We're deprived of 32 moles of ATP all of a sudden. Now the problem with this is that your energy output is significantly lower. Now the issue is that most people train too intense and if they train too intense what happens is that their body gets used to building being in anaerobic zones all the time which means they're handicapped from the start. You understand the problem now? It's, 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 it is a significant problem. This is why most people need, need to build up a solid aerobic base first. But you, how do you build up a solid aerobic base? And that's my next point. Diversification is key. I mean diversification in training zones. So most people, that's the next mistake, most people do one thing all the time. I did a video a couple of years ago, the classic training mistakes. I'm going to link it in the description. Most people stick to one intensity zone they have, I think they call it UG1, UG2, and UG3, and then intensity. Most people stick to one UT, let's say UT2, and they do this all the time. The thing is that they don't know if UT2 is correct for the day. The background, scientific background. Um, when we talk about aerobic and anaerobic, we measure lactate in the blood. There's one way to measure that. Most people 
thing and science, whatever that means, has come to the conclusion that uh, four millimole of lactate measured in the blood seems to be exactly when you move from aerobic to anaerobic state. The point is that we actually don't know. It's an average measured with sports students mostly. We don't know. Honestly, nobody knows. You can measure something else with these masks, and then I keep it simple. They measure the gas that you inhale versus the gas that you exhale. And if a certain coefficient is close to one, we can expect, it's called the RQ, we can estimate that now you could be, you could be anaerobic. The point is that you can't train with a mask all the time with, with these oxygen measurement masks. I'm not a big fan of masks overall. So you need to compensate somehow. And the best way that I found after talking to many scientists who couldn't, none of them could answer my questions. I came to the conclusion that we have to train everything because we need everything in rowing. After the warm up, you usually sit around for 45 minutes before they actually <laughs> allow you to start. I mean, you do all the warm up, then you sit around forever. Everybody who's raced before, you know that. And then um, you start with maybe two minimum of lactate and eventually you end up with 12 to 20 millimole. 20 is very high. Some people even exceed that. I personally never exceeded 14, 15 millimole. For me, that felt like dying. For other people, 2022 feels like dying. Some people can take more, some people can take less. It doesn't necessarily mean you, there are differences in what outputs, it's just how your body works. Um, so the later we become anaerobic during a race, the more effective we can be because the ATP output per mole of glucose is better. It's that simple. So I have to train you in such a way that you are so strong in the aerobic zones that you, you switch to that anaerobic production mode as late as possible. You ultimately, in every race, you will. The question is when. The later, the better. So I want to make sure you fast for a long period of time without being anaerobic. And then, that's the anaerobic mode now, then I want you to be able to tolerate as much lactate as possible. And most people don't train that properly. I recently gave um, an interview to the German Schubschlag podcast on, on, I think they're on Spotify. Excellent podcast, highly recommend it. I'm going to link it in the description below as well. And Carsten Jeski um, and Matthias Zander, Zappe, they, they asked the question, um, which system is my preferred training system? And my answer was I've trained on a couple different systems. I know uh, the French system, I know the East German system, I know the West German system, I know um, the so-called Danish system, which is essentially not, as far as I know, you guys in Denmark don't have one system. Because if we talk to different athletes, they always do something kind of different, which makes sense. Um, I've, I've, I know the Italian system and I know the, and the American system. The thing is that all of these systems work for certain people, but you're not considered to be a talent if that system doesn't happen to work for you. And this is where I think we need to individualize much more. And this is where I think we need a, a mix of that, melange, as they said it. Uh, in, in Vienna, there's a coffee, it's called melange. So it's a mix. I start the season with strength, um, hypertrophy. And strength, as we reach peak of season, towards the end of the season, is eventually be faded out just before peak of season. Um, aerobic endurance accompanies us all the time. What is not said in there is that we actually vary and say we do, um, I'm more in the lower zones at the beginning of the season. I target the mid zones for most of the season and the last quarter to the third. We're putting out, my, my athletes, you guys know that, high, 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 high intensities. I mean intensities where the, where the goal is to fail. Not fail, but passing out. Fail to hold the pace and still struggle. It's a mental thing, most people can do it. You're, you're trained to succeed all the time. You can't fail, you can't fail, you can't fail. And I have to teach my athlete, hey, the design is that you fail in training to hold the pace, not always, but sometimes on specific occasions. A, you can take it because we have built you up. Your aerobic endurance is so good. You recover so quickly. It will not get you into overtraining. Um, you increase your V2 max with this and it helps you mentally because you lose the fear of failing. Most people say, ah, oh, in a race I'm going to give it all, but realistically, they're not. You, you cannot learn a poem the moment you have to perform it. 
you have to learn it before. Now, in a race, you have to know where the limit is. How far can you go before you start to fail? If you've never seen that, how do you want to conquer another country if you, leave, if you never leave your own borders? It's not possible. So, in training, we have, it doesn't mean we always do this. These are very few, very select units. And realistically, even if it says high intensity on the sheet, most people are not able to do it. Maybe there are one or two, three sessions where you're able to do it. And that's what counts. So for the most part, we are, we are actually slowly preparing the body to cope with race pace. And because we've done so much strength, the bones and joints and, 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 and ligaments and tendons can take it. And because the bones and joints and tendons and ligaments and cartilages can take it, we can do so much aerobic work. Or we can do aerobic work without the bad aftermath. And because we can do solid aerobic work, we can do solid anaerobic work. We can do all the uncomfortable stuff because the body has been very comfortably accustomed to it. I, I think that's, that's the secret. Now I've prepared something for you. Um, which is not the way I actually write my plane because I don't hand out my planes, but it is exemplary. I want to show you how the system works. You see here it says weeks to peak. So whenever I plane a year, I calculate, okay, 52 weeks of peak, 52 weeks until peak of season, 41 weeks until peak of season. You may enter the season at 24 weeks until peak of season. The thing is that I have a strategy. I know exactly what we're going to do. Why? Because I've been coaching now for what? I started when I was 14, wrote my first training plans when I was 17. I'm 40 now. I've been doing this for more than 20 years. So that's, that's a lot of experience. And every season I ask my athletes, hey, what worked for you? What didn't work? What made you feel strong? How did you react to that? How did you react to this? My, my attitude is if the plane doesn't work for you, it's not your fault, it's my fault. I have to change it as a coach and make sure the plane works. And here, when we say, okay, 52 weeks until peak of season, this is when you see zones up to three millimole of lactate. If you, if you can't measure millimole of lactate, um, there is a very good, I found a very good way to predict your heart rate. I made my own chart based on, I don't know how many hundreds and thousands of lactate tests I've done. And that is actually pretty accurate. And what I start to do is at camps, at rowing camps, I start to offer lactate tests. So we have lactate step tests you can do in-house here. So when people fly in, next rowing camp is going to be in Budapest um, in uh, May 2024. Go to armtraining.com, please. This is where I have, if, if you go to rowing camp 24 or camp 24, this is where you find all the info. If you see this video at a later point of time, past 2024, you will find all the current information on armtraining.com. Okay, so this is, we're at zone three. Um, maybe I should explain the training zones for now, how I do this. I have 11 different cardio zones and you, some people say you can never trigger that so accurately. The thing is you can trigger that accurately enough. As we don't know if you're anaerobic at three minimal, four, five, six or seven, we have to train them all, all these levels. And this is what we have rig. UMO three four five six seven race pace and high intensity. Reg essentially is super easy. So if you want to go by the arm system, reg means um, it comes from from German regeneration. It means recovery pace. It's a light paddle. Um, you use reg as a light paddle in between, um, where you just go easy. You don't focus on heart rate. You don't focus on stroke rate. You just go easy. If reg is used at the beginning of a session, you do focus on stroke rate usually around fourteen to sixteen, and perceived load should be a 1 to 1.5. You see, I'm using the perceived load scale as well because that is, scientifically speaking, very accurate. So, also my experience says that this is super accurate. It takes two weeks, three weeks before you get used to that, but um, one is the easiest, six is so hard you don't know how to continue. In 0 0.5 increments, and that helps you to judge very well where you are. So, reg should be a 1 to 1.5. Um, 61 to 64% of your maximum heart rate. U and M and O, everything evolves around uh, 1.4 to 2.1 minimum of lactate. Um, U, M, O also derives from German words, unteres, mittleres, oberes, extensive 1. 
then perceived load should be between 1.5 and 2.5. Stroke rate's usually between 16 and 21. 21 if you pull a lot of watts. So I've athletes at an O2 millimole, they pull 300 watts, 320, but then their stroke rate is a bit higher than that. And, and some people pull it, oh, maybe 150 or 100. It's, it's not how many watts you pull, it's the delta that counts. Are you improving or not? Heart rate, roughly 64 to 75% of your max. Then we have zone three, four, five, six, and seven. It ranges from 2.8 to 7.2 millimole of lactate. That actually is, is named by the millimole, uh, by the millimole states that we try to measure. And that ranges from 78 to 95% of your max heart rate. Seven is high, that's hard, that's hard stuff. Stroke rates go, depending on where you are, from 21, if you're a raw power based athlete, all the way to minus three strokes of your maximum uh, race pace, mid race pace stroke rate, not sprint, okay? So you see the formula I've got here. And race pace is your standard average mid race pace. No sprints, where are you mid race? And high intensity is maximum speed every stroke try to fail. So if it says two minutes high intensity after 30 seconds, you should have no clue how to hold that pace and you shouldn't be able to, you should struggle because every second you struggle is a struggle, is, is, is an effective second of training. Training something you, you can already do most of the time doesn't make much sense. But again, this is um, nothing to create a sensation on YouTube. My goal is to convey this the way it is. The way it is that we use this very selectively, very carefully. If you do high intensity all winter, you're done. That's also why I don't like to do 2K erg tests in winter, 1K erg tests or 5K erg tests. If you have to do them, do them. But it, in the winter, especially bigger teams, have, have a nurse come in and do lactate testing. Have my athletes improved their lactate levels compared. So are they building less lactate with higher watts and lower heart rate? That is what matters the most in winter. And if you can't measure lactate as a masters athlete training alone at home, has your perceived load and your heart rate um, become lower compared to the watts or compared to the speed you can pull. That's what's relevant in the winter. There is no use testing high intensity when we don't prepare for high intensity. If you want to do it, go for it, but I don't recommend it. The thing is that your body needs to, that's also a mental but also a physical thing I think. The body needs to learn to have trust and that's an issue I see with many collegiate teams, many growing teams in general. Um, really also masters is is there, it's, it's pretty much omnipresent there's no trust there's no trust in the system there's no trust in the coach people perceive a good workout to be something where you go high intensity all the time yeah that was a good workout today hey that's cheap to sell it doesn't make you fast but it's cheap to sell that coach made me work very hard that's effective no maybe on that day hard work wasn't a good thing the thing is that you the reason why i do these videos is so, so that I can convey, look, professional training works differently. Professional training has a clear structure for every, every, every week of the year. And I write every day of the year before the year even starts. Doesn't mean it's rigid. We adapt. But as a coach, I have to have a plan. I've got to have a strategy. I've got to have the oversight. Hey, 20 weeks until peak of season. We can juggle around. We can do three weeks recovery and then, then that, oh, then, but then we should be here. How can I get you there? Oh, okay, this way. There, there's so much more to talk about, but the most important thing is that you have an idea that you anticipate recovery periods, high intensity all the time is not good, low, low stuff all the time is not good. You need a good structure. You need to trust the system that the coach will not judge you negatively if you say you need a break coach should anticipate that and if it if, and if he or she doesn't anticipate that um, she or he should listen say hey you need a break cool how do you feel that's the most important thing when I work with people you know I have people who are in a different hotel room every night so I know the hotel gyms and I structure accordingly I've got total beginners they learn to row on a by rower and they're slowly making the way into competitive rowing awesome works I got people who contacted me six weeks before major championships 
bigger than world championships. I feel training plan, what should I do? Okay, let's do this. And I have people just want to say, hey, um, my daughter wants to be fast also in five years. She doesn't want to be burned by the system in five years. Can you guide her in the background? Can you talk with the coaches that she has on site? Can you remotely coordinate that, please? Can you monitor that? Can you have oversight? So we can have a structured buildup over one, two, three, four, five, six years because she's in for the long game. That's how it, I think it makes sense. And also, hey, I'm a master's rower. Um, I just started to row two years ago. I want to become competitive. What do I need to do? This, this, and this, and that. Or, hey, I'm 20 kilos. I'm 30 kilos. I'm 40 kilos overweight. I don't want to hurt myself going to a CrossFit gym. What should I do? This, 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 and that. With this being said, if you want to work with me, my website is rmtraining.com. I'm looking forward to meet you. Join the discussion on rowing.zone. I don't know if you heard about this. I created a social network just for rowing. It's small, it's tiny, and slowly growing. And I'm welcoming every new member. I want to create a place where everybody who likes rowing can meet. And I've added a classified ads system to it. It's free. Everybody can place an ad and sell his or her stuff. That's how I want to shape a community that um, is open to everyone and friendly and welcoming. With this being said, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate your time. I hope it was worth your time. If you have any questions, please contact me. You'll find me on the rowing.zone and my user is at arm. Thank you for subscribing. It's very important to me. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.